Welcome to this edition of The Conversation here at The Dakotan. I'm Jonathan Starr, and today I'm joined by a member of the House all the way from District 16 in Fargo, West Fargo, Ben Koppelman. Thank you for joining us today, Ben. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. So our listeners won't know who you are, even though you've been in the House since 2013, you've been around. Um, so why don't you just start by introducing yourself? Well, I'm a, uh, a small businessman. I'm in the uh, commercial construction field. I'm uh, married and I have uh, two children and uh, one grandchild, one more on the way. So uh, people don't believe that, that I can be a grandpa, but uh, I tell them that's way easier to be a young grandpa than it is to be an old grandpa. So at least, at least that's what I think, because I've never been an old grandpa. But, um, but no, I, I, uh, I have a, a, a background in construction. I joined the House of Representatives after the 2012 election was on the school board for four years prior, also served on an appointed capacity on the state electrical board. So that's why I kind of get into that realm every once in a while. I'm probably the, the most prominent defender of the Second Amendment when it comes to legislation um, in, our, in the House of Representatives, at least. Um, I've probably introduced uh, at least a dozen, if not maybe even closer to 20 um, gun bills that uh, always restore the rights of the Second Amendment not uh, ever cause more gun control. Um, so those people that think that more bills are bad, that's not always the case because sometimes that's how we get our rights back. Um, I've been a defender of other amendments uh, such as the First Amendment and free speech and, and uh, also people's right to vote. I've been a defender of the Fourth Amendment when it comes to not having unreasonable search and seizure. Um, so I'm really kind of a constitutional guy. That's where I'm comfortable. Um, I do believe in local control, but I don't believe that locals should be able to control the Constitution. I think that's something that's somewhat set in stone. Um, I've spent time on the Education Committee, um, on the Finance and Tax Committee, on the Industry, Business and Labor Committee, on Transportation Committee, and uh, as well as the Government and Veterans Affairs Committees during the session. So I have a really kind of a broad experience through that. Um, in the interim, I've also served on the Judiciary Committee and I chaired the, um, the Government Services Committee this time around, which studied homelessness, studied construction methods for doing government projects, and then also studied the uh, having a committee of legislators that would oversee new state buildings and renovations. All right. So you've done a lot. Um, maybe we should just went by stuff that you haven't been involved in. What, as you have experienced those different opportunities, what has been some of the f- most favorite places to get work done in? Well, um, as mentioned, I mean, the, uh, the uh, Second Amendment arena, um, right. once I entered that kind of arena, um, I started small. I started looking at our concealed weapons license, really trying to um, figure out why we're banned from carrying so many places after getting a license and jumping through all these hoops. And So we've been peeling that onion back a bit, restoring those constitutional rights. Um, But uh, outside of the Second Amendment stuff, um, when I got into finance and tax, one of the reasons why that was a natural fit was because I had an understanding of the tax code that um, I just don't think a lot of legislators have. And so uh, as I read things, I tend to retain a lot of that knowledge. And so I could build kind of logical um, conclusions and, and solutions to problems as it related to the tax code. Um, I've always been a believer in um, fair and equitable taxation, which to me is flat taxation. It's the okay. idea of if you're gonna have an income tax, it shouldn't be progressive. If you're gonna have a property tax, it shouldn't be progressive. And I know we'll probably get into that topic. And so, so I've got a lot of background there. The education background stuff kind of just happened because I had been on the school board. Right. Um, I don't necessarily have a passion for the inner workings of school districts and things of that nature. I believe we need to have good schools. I need. I believe that we should have both public and private options. Um, and I believe that people of various uh, financial means should be able to choose between those options. Yeah, very good. So you, obviously you first ran back in 2012, that time frame. Um, what was your reason for wanting to get into the state level? You served on the school board or local level, but why did you want to go and jump to the state level? Well, I've been active in the state level legislative politics. It started where my father was in the legislature for many years. So I got exposed to the process that way. But then I kind of went on my own and I I started um, really trying to get legislators to promote good legislation for business, to 
to improve mm-hmm. things there. When I was on the school board, I got them to promote legislation that that I you know believes made the districts better. Um, so I, I sort of became an advocate a little bit in that regard, and uh, decided that uh, you know I can probably do this. Um, the timing of it um, related to them creating new legislative districts where. District 16 was moved um, from uh, Northeast North Dakota down to West Fargo and uh, nobody was incumbents because there was nobody right. from here that was in. And so as they started to look for candidates, I guess my name kind of came up toward the top and and I ended up doing that. I uh, was the only Republican elected from that des- district the first time around. So anybody that hasn't had the opportunity to serve with Democrats um, um, also, in, um, from their district, uh, it's, it's, it's a different experience. I'm not going to say I recommend it for everybody because I certainly <laughs> do not. But um, but I was friendly with my colleagues that were on, across the aisle from my district, and, and we worked together to try to promote things that were good for our district. And uh, and uh, they uh, uh, became one termer. So, so you're going to get bit by the term limit bug that is approaching here soon. Is term limits good for North Dakota? Uh, obviously, we're going to get into you being house uh, running for house majority lead and stuff like that. And, and some of the stuff you guys are going to have to figure out how it's going to work long term. Um, how, how do you see term limits affecting North Dakota in the long term? Well, I think we might have to talk about how they affect North Dakota in the short term first. And that yeah, is right. we've got to sort out what's going to happen with people like myself who have never been elected or appointed since term limits came into to uh, to be. And uh, that was on the ballot in 2022. Uh, and mm-hmm. I believe the effective date was December 1st of 22. Well, you had a whole class of legislators that got elected in November of 22, along with the term limits measure, and had they took office the same day as that effective date of that measure. So I think the measure is clear that they can serve two four-year terms because they, they started office on that same time. Now, anybody that's been appointed after that effective date um, they know what happens with them. I think the measure is clear on that. I think what the measure is not clear on is what was supposed to happen with those people that were had two years left of an old term elected by a different electorate with no retroactivity uh, language in the measure. And so um, I have a, a plan to introduce a bill that will, will assist in just um, making that clear. I think the intent of voters when they passed it was that every legislator get a chance to serve two terms. And so what this measure would simply say that the legislature would vote on is simply say that our interpretation as the legislature is that the triggering mechanism on your eight years in office is either being elected or appointed um, where, um, when you would take office on or after the date of the effectiveness of the measure. So those that got elected last time, obviously they took office the same day it was effective. So their eight years started then. And those of us that have been either elected or appointed, our date would start this November. So when we start December 1st on a new term, that would start our eight-year clock. And by simply doing that, that would take care of term limits in the short term. Now, I can tell you, I have never been a proponent for legislative term limits. Here's why. We go to Bismarck for four months every two years. And the other, you know, 17, 18 months, I guess what it would be, 20 months of a two-year period, we got to go live under those laws like everybody else. We can't create laws that are unique to us. And so we cannot become elitists. We cannot become career politicians in the sense that governments are only world. We don't understand what the real world looks like because we go back to the real world every time. Right. And so the people that don't have term limits, ironically enough, in North Dakota are, let's just say, the, uh, the agriculture commissioner or secretary of state or the treasurer or the insurance commissioner. And you say, well, they do nothing but be government, you know, 40 hours a week, um, a full, you know, every year of their term. And so they're the ones who don't have to go back into the private sector. Now they still have private lives, but they don't have to go back into the business sector to the working sector that we all have to go back into. And they have no term limit. So I believe we're the most part-time legislature of all 50 states. And I believe we've got the strictest term limit of all 50 states. And I'm not sure those go well together. Right. I think the long-term outcome of term limits is that um, people think it's going to be lobbyists that rule the day. I think they're wrong. I think it's going to be bureaucrats that rule the day. I think you're going to get the the so-and-so head of something or other in the Department of Human Services that comes in and tells you you have a need that you have no choice but to fund. And mm-hmm. the legislators who have only been there a short time are going to go, okay, yeah, I right. guess that information makes sense, rather than having the long-term knowledge of saying, hold on, that was tried 16 years ago and the legislature said no, or 
you know, the, the legislature tried it and it went very poorly. So we're not going to do that again. You you won't have that knowledge unless uh, one of the, those people of the bureaucracy decide to offer it. And so if anything, ironically enough, the lobbyists might be the only people that have that counter interest to the bureaucrats that might say, hold on, that was already tried, uh, newbie legislators. You know, we don't think you should do right. that. I think that people will come to regret term limits in the long term, but I don't want to try to push them toward changing the term limits now. Um, simply because I don't think they, they would, it would look self-serving if we pushed them now, but I think in the long term they're going to, they're going to wish they had elected people that had that, that institutional knowledge. So North Dakota is a conservative state. We know that. Um, and one of the things that North Dakotans like uh, probably across the board, but especially in that conservative group is, is Liberty, their liberties. That's something that you hear about a lot, freedoms and stuff like that. Do you feel like it's a conflict with term limits being put in place and essentially taking away part of their freedom to vote? Well, that's certainly a perspective. Uh, what's most curious about the term limits to me is the lifetime ban. So if I yeah. serve eight years in the house in my 20s and eight years in my 60s, what does one have to do with the other? Mm-hmm. And in the old uh, Spaceballs quote uh, where the Darth Vader character says absolutely nothing. I mean, that, they really have nothing to do with each other. They're, they're um, not connected. I think the idea of term limits is to remove uh, a certain elected official from their power base so that they cannot become either power drunk or corrupt or self-serving in what they do in office. But I think a much shorter break if we were going to have term limits would be in order. Other states say you got to sit out one cycle. Well, if you're the chairman of the, let's say, the Appropriations Committee and you sit out four years, I guarantee you somebody else is filling that void. Somebody else will have two sessions at the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. So even if you came back in, it's not like everybody else hold the phone, Ben Koppelman's back, and we're going to make him the chairman again. It wouldn't work like that. And it wouldn't Mm -hmm. work like that as majority leader or anything else. And so the only thing I would bring back with me is maybe the knowledge and hopefully the respect of having been there before. But it would not be a corrupt or self-serving in, in what people are trying to do with term limits. So I think, that, you know, some iteration of this 10 years down the road is probably um, either amend the term limits to be something where, you know, where, where they, people can get back in or do away with them at all. But to your point, who do you want representing you? Do you want the best out there or do you just want the best that you, you can find that haven't done it already? Right. And I think that's two different buckets of people. I'm going to ask one last question on this and then we'll move on. And it's an either or. Do you think it's more likely that term limits gets amended? Say you mentioned 10 years, whatever that time frame is. So let's say 16 years. In the next 16 years, term limits gets amended or that we move to a full-time legislature? I think I think it's more likely it gets amended um, or, or repealed, one of the two. Right. Um, I, I could see uh, the possibility of the people initiating a measure where they put term limits in for all the full-time politicians and at the same time amend our term limits to something that's much more reasonable, maybe a 12 or a 16 term, um, a year term limit, and then you have to sit out four years, that sort of thing. I, I'd say think that would be, if people want term limits for the legislature, much more workable. Um, the full-time legislature really makes me cringe. I could see us going to annual sessions. Uh, right. maybe two and a half months per year or something like that. And quite frankly, I'd probably prefer that because it'd be easier for my real job to just plan around. Yeah. But um, I know there's many people that are resistant to that idea as well. Very good. Moving on, you want or you are planning on running for the House uh, Majority Lead. Um, first off, why is this something that has become a priority at this point in your legislative career? Well, believe it or not, it really has very little to do with my legislative career other than I've been around long enough to be respected, maybe, or at least I mm-hmm. believe that's to be true. And I have that institutional knowledge that that helps um, advise other people, lead other people, understand other people. Um, but the main reason I'm running is out of necessity. Uh, we have head down a trajectory over the last six to eight years that is unhealthy. I mean, our, our caucus is, is becoming uh, more divergent, but most importantly, it's becoming more disrespectful. So when I came into the legislature, you know, we, we used to practice what we call civil discourse or statesmanship or just, you know, old fashioned respect. And that's why Democrats and Republicans, they used to say could go have a beer after five o'clock because you could be friends and absolutely disagree on policy. And um, often you had two people that were friends or at least friendly 
that would work together to find the compromise. Well, how do you compromise with people you hate right. or people that you just can't stand to be in the same room with? And I just do not see us turning the corner, um, going down the same road we have been with leadership to repairing that void. I think we need to have a leader that's willing to um, understand the differences in the caucus and respect those and not demand that one group or another conform to their will. That, that's not the right way. We've got to look and represent that Grand Forks might send a different type of Republican to Bismarck than uh, Hazen does. And when those two come together, they have to respect each other's positions. I think we need to point leadership in the various committee chairmanships, vice chairmanships, appropriations committee, that represents the segments of the of the caucus. So if you've got uh, half the caucus that's quite conservative and another half that maybe is made up of um, some quite liberal members and some in the middle, then you then you need to put chairmanships in place so that each group of that caucus feels like they are plugged in, like like somebody from their faction or which I don't like the word of, but their like mindedness has a, has a voice, has a position. And we, we did not see a balance of that last session. We saw, um, uh, I would say, about half the caucus being alienated from position. And I think what's the natural thing that happens? Then you have kind of a revolt on your hands. So then guys like me who want to see things be constructive, my candidate last time for majority leader didn't win. Mm -hmm. And me and, and the supporters of that can, candidate um, did poorly in the in the uh, in the leadership rankings of of where we were going to be put. I don't want to go as far as to say it was retribution. I'm not sure it was that intentional. It just felt that way to people. And so then, when I'm trying to be constructive throughout last session, and I'm trying to rally the troops of the like-minded people that aren't a big fan of the leader, mainly because they feel left out, then it's a really tough gap to bridge. And I hope to bridge that gap this time. I can tell you, I have no ill will toward our current leader, Michael Four. Um, I just think that that a fresh perspective might be what's in order. Absolutely. Can you break down now? I understand for all the people that are going to be voting in this process, they fully understand. But for listeners, for the everyday Joe, we've seen it, how it went down on the national stage with McCarthy and, and all that. How does the process work in North Dakota in the legislature to appoint or elect the next House Majority Leader? Well, the first thing to point out is on the national level, McCarthy's Speaker of the House. That's the most powerful role. The majority leader is number two in Congress, in U.S. Congress. In the North Dakota legislature, it's the opposite. The majority leader has the most power. The speaker is number two. Um, the speaker in North Dakota typically gets replaced every session. It's, it's very seldom, if ever, been, been duplicated where they've repeated being speaker. Um, but majority leader has often been reelected for a period of time. So the longevity, the, the, the consistency is generally in the majority leader's office. Um, the way we're elected is we're elected by our peers. So each one of the House of Representatives members that are going to be either sworn in or continue their service come December 1st, um, they'll come to a meeting in November and they'll all cast a secret ballot. And the Republican caucus is likely to have 82 or 83 members this time around. And so it's going to most likely take 42 votes, which is 50% plus one, to, uh, to elect the leader. And so, um, you know, I think it's going to be a close race. I right. do have confidence that I can win this race. And I believe that uh, the, my opponent believes I can win this race because I think he's campaigning hard. Yeah. Um, I would say if I don't win this race, uh, it's, it's, uh, the, or if I do. Um, the outcome of how we run this race and how the victor treats the loser in this race is going to be the building blocks of how we repair the relationship in the caucus. Last time there was a vendetta between the top two vote getters. That can't happen this time, right. regardless of who wins. And I think the fact that I've set that goal very straight, Mike LaFour and I met weeks and weeks ago to, to, to talk about that. And I made my position clear. I think he's in agreement. And that it's going to be a constructive campaign and that we're going to try to do our best to embrace those that don't vote for us after the race. Um, like I said, it's probably going to turn out to be a close ballot. It's probably whoever wins is going to win by less than two or three votes. Um, but the important thing is what ha what's happens the day after that. And right. uh, that's going to be up to the victor to decide. It's a very different election than what the again people would be used to because it's very transparent you guys get to see who voted for you who didn't vote for you it's all up on the, well, the screen and actually actually it's a secret ballot at our oh it caucus. is my bad so it, okay yeah. 
Yeah. I, so it's a, it's a secret ballot, and it's actually good that it is. Right. Because because then the I mean we kind of know who votes for whom, but uh, we never know with all certainty. Um, but it really shouldn't matter. It should be um, whoever's the winner should say, okay, I won. Let's just say with forty three votes. Well, good for me. Well, what right. did you win? And and the answer is nothing until I make my next step because it takes 48 votes to pass a bill in the House, which is 50% yeah. plus one. So 43 votes doesn't pass anything. And so you've got to figure how to embrace the rest. And and I think it would be pretty poor form for us to try to embrace the Democrats to bring them over to bring our, our be our other five votes because the chances are our policies wouldn't align. Right. And so we're better have a better chance of you trying to unite our caucus at least to the point where we're treating everybody with respect. We don't have to love everybody in terms of like be best friends, but we do have to be respectful. If that happens, I believe our caucus will have a better chance of getting things done. And if we can get things done, hopefully we can get back to the things that matter for policy purposes, like scope and size of government, rather than just spend money on everything and, and have the train run out of control, which is kind of how I felt toward the end of last session when the, uh, when the spending you know, was really finalized. So if elected, what, what are some of the maybe top three priorities that's normally the number that we each go with uh, that you would have in, in that role to make sure that was accomplished during this upcoming legislative session? Well, the first I kind of hit on already, which is improving the relationship of the caucus, uh, bringing back respect. That's going to be achieved through, through education by, you know, I, I'd like to bring in a speaker or two to just talk about how that can happen. And I do know that there's are those speakers out there that can do that. I think um, communication all the way through the, the session, having weekly caucuses, sometimes maybe even caucuses twice a week, so that everybody knows what's going on. The Senate has done that every single week in, in recent years, and they're always better informed than the House is. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't blame our current leader for that. That's a problem that goes back several leaders. But, um, but I, wanna, I wanna have weekly caucuses at least um, also, um, plugging everybody in based on their strengths and what they're good at and where their knowledge base is at, regardless of if they're my supporters or not. If they're willing to work with me, you know, I have no problem appointing chairmen that aren't my carbon copy. In fact, I think that's, that's important to make sure that you gain everybody's respect. So that's kind of the number one is, is, is building the caucus back positively. Number two, we have to reform property tax. And I know we'll unpack that in a minute, but that's a huge priority for me is reforming property tax. And it can't just be, we'll take over the school mills or, you know, it can't be these little nibble around the edges deal. It's gotta be real. It's gotta be significant. And I think the third um, item is to try to um, structure our budgeting in such a way so that we can afford to spend what we spend, you know, in the long term. I mean, we're, we're projected to have a $19 billion total spending this, this session from what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues that are in the appropriations committee. Um, I think we set a record at about 18 billion last time. Um, 20 years ago, uh, we probably spent 3 billion. And uh, it has been said that we spend significantly more than our sister state, South Dakota. Uh, right. I wanna be clear that I'm, I'm not saying we should spend the same amount as South Dakota does. I think South Dakota does some things poorly. Mm -hmm. But um, we do need to right size that and do it in such a way where we're not solely reliant on oil money to um, to uh, fill our our appetite to spend going forward. All right. Well, let's let's jump into uh, the property tax issue. Okay. Um. First off, I think start here. Why this has been something that has been on the people's minds for a while, I believe. And we've seen that because it has come up in legislative session before. Why, what is wrong with the way that property tax is done in North Dakota currently? Well, um, first I'll start with perception. Perception is that if, um, that if my valuation of my property goes up, I automatically pay more taxes. Right. That's not actually true. That's perception. The truth is that if the uh, local political subdivision, if your city charges you the same rate on that on against your valuation that your taxes will go up if your value goes up but they have the ability to reduce the rate but um they've proven over the last 12 years that i've been in the legislature that they're that they're not willing to cut the rate to a point where your property tax dollars are are managing only an inflationary increase what we've seen is we've bought down all sorts of taxes we took over 
75, 80% of the school taxes. We took over all of the social service taxes away from the counties. And you know what that got us? Just about nothing. Nobody credits us with solving the problem. Everybody, every political subdivision has backfilled those taxes. Some use it as an opportunity to build a new courthouse or build a new school. Other use it just as an opportunity to spend more. But, uh, but the locals backfilled all of the property tax quote unquote relief that we've provided over the last 12 years. So we need a, a structural change. So uh, when we look at, at the other parts of, of property tax, why they need to be changed, they're very convoluted and complicated in calculating mm -hmm. what you're gonna pay. That needs to get simpler. Right. Um, and we need to recognize the pressure that we've put on single family homeowners, uh, those primary residents that we have in our state. And so the solution to that, I believe, is that we need to, to get rid of valuation, just throw it away and yeah. say, well, what are we gonna replace it with? And you say, well, how about something fixed? Like how about square footage? Say, if you live in a 2000 square foot house, then let's take, say your tax is 2000 times something. And so the city can say it's a dollar a square foot. Well, that means your tax is $2,000 and, and so on. Um, that's very simple, very easy mm -hmm. for people to understand. And then the next year, if they say we want a dollar 25 a square foot, everybody's like, no, 25% increase is too much. Everybody can understand that. Nobody, unless they're, they're knowledgeable in this area, can understand our model now. Um, so, so that's important. Um, that's structural. That's something we've never even a, um, tried to do in the time I've been in the legislature. Right. It, okay. So actually, I want to talk about this first. I was going to jump into measure four and all this, but on this subject, you talk about the switch from assessed value to square footage. And obviously, homes are worth different amounts and there can be different reasons. You can have a corner lot that that has a ton more uh, square footage that is road uh, facing and it can be problems with snow. It, there can be a tons of problems that occur and that in another lot uh, is in the middle of nowhere. It has low value um, and there's no problems that it occurs. But all these are going to essentially receive a, my understanding is this where we would have a flat tax rate um, that would be the consistent across the board. It's not that everybody would get taxed the same, but it would be an equal taxing system. Is that fair for somebody that has a million dollar home that's 2,000 square feet and somebody that has a $100,000, $120,000 home that has a basement that's useless but uh, or a second floor that's useless, however the square footage uh, uh, can be counted, um, but that's also 2,000 2, square feet and they're saying that they're paying the same amount in taxes. Is, is that fair? Well, I think we have to ask ourselves the question just hypothetically, is it fair to have um, a, a person that makes a million dollars a year pay 30% tax on a million versus a person that makes 80,000 a year pay 10% tax? Mm -hmm. um, some would say that's fair. I mean, we hear from the left, you know, we want the rich to pay their fair share. Well, what is fair share? Right. I mean, if you look at it in sales tax, nobody's out there saying that if I buy 25 cars, and you buy one, that my tax rate per car I buy should be 9% when you pay five. Nobody's mm -hmm. saying that. Most people that are in the center or right of center don't think that a flat income tax is problematic. They think it makes sense because the more you earn, the more you pay. If you don't want to pay more, don't earn more. You know, simple right. as that. So they're all cause and effect, just like sales tax is cause and effect. So when I'm at my house, you got to ask yourself, why do we pay property tax? What do we get? Mm -hmm. It's fee for service. It's not, it's not anything except for that. So you say, well, you know, I want police protection. Well, do you want police protection? Okay. We probably want it the same amount. Okay. Right. Am I, am I likely, if my house is worth more, am I likely to need twice as much police? Probably not. Matter of fact, I think statistically speaking, the lower the house is worth, probably the more police calls that go there just mm -hmm. for other reasons. Same thing with fire department. Do I need more fire protection if you and I both have a 2000 square foot house, but but mine has gold faucets and yours doesn't. Right. No, because at the end of the day, they're just going to waterlog our house with water when the fire starts and we're, our house are both going to be wrecked. So right. I mean, yeah. it, it really doesn't, we don't need different services. So the question is, why should I pay twice as much? Mm -hmm. And once you look at it from that perspective, nobody can answer that question other than if they want to go back to the old progressive income tax model of, well, because you can afford to, you have more discretionary money. But we also have to look at it and say, this is only a piece of the reform puzzle that I'm getting, that I've gotten to, which is the changing the structure. The system is simplified 
And, uh, and, and I believe once we look at what the next shoe to drop it would be, which is the homestead tax credit for everybody. Okay. Then we start to see the piece come together. So then we're like, okay, we wrote, don't really care about businesses that much. If one, if they're taxed the same or not the same, because everything for them kind of gets passed along to the consumer. It's part of a cost of doing business. Um, nobody seems to argue about that. Uh, what they argue about is on the housing side. Well, what right. if I told you that we could afford as a state to reduce every primary residence property tax by 75%? No ballot measure needed, no special tax increase. Um, it would cost about $500 million, maybe as high as 600, depending on how we classify properties. But every single primary resident, regardless of income, regardless of disability, regardless of age, because those are all factors in, our, in what we have for homestead tax credits now, they'd all get it. And so then if people say, where's my tax relief? I'd say, go look at your house because everybody got it. Right. And so at that point, if you get a 75% reduction, it doesn't really matter if this structural change from value to square footage creates some winners and losers in the primary residence area. Because, you know, if I'm paying 75% less in tax and you're paying 68, I mean, both of us are pretty satisfied that we're in a better shape. Right. Um, so, so that's the piece that, that sort of, you know, uh, makes that more practical. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. So let's jump at measure four. Obviously, this is something before you have an opportunity to present any plan. We're going to find out if if this is going to pass in November. Um, and this would eliminate property tax as we know it, but it would not go away completely. It would still be there and it, it would still have the option uh, to be applied on different values besides assessed value. Um, so first off, what is your opinion? Is this a maybe you don't want to give a yes or no answer on it because it's voting. If you do, we would take it. But what's your view on this measure for ballot measure? Well, I know there may be other ballot measures we talked about as well today. So well, let me just tell you that the ballot measures that, that are placed there by the people that aren't initiated mm -hmm. by the legislature, right. I generally don't offer kind of like a personal opinion on those because I need to have my legislative hat on. Yeah. Um, so when I, I look at the pros of measure four, are 100% property tax re relief as far as ad valorem goes. And the likely thing to live beyond that at your local level is gonna be some other type of tax, like a higher use of special assessments to bridge the gap, some use of a square footage tax, like I've already said, but this would be layered on top, um, or possibly an increase in sales tax, increase in water fees or infrastructure fees, and so on. There'll be probably many pieces to what the new um, costs of, of the growth in local government will be. Um, so, so that's part of what's likely to come out of measure four. Um, but I can tell you personally, from just a dollars and cents standpoint, I'm like seven times better off with measure four than I am with the proposal that I would bring to the legislature because I'd get at all my commercial stuff. I'd get, I get my taxes right. wiped out. I mean, it, you know, it, it'd be a, it'd be a, you know, just a gangbusters thing for me financially if we measure four passed. but, um, but there's also the challenges of that. So, so that's what the proponents would say is that you just get rid of it um, and then nobody can ever seize your house because you don't pay your taxes. Uh, you hear mm -hmm. that from, or, or your commercial property, whatever. Right. Um, the, I, I am a little bit um, concerned about the disconnect between the different messages. Um, the legislature um, statutorily has to study through their legislative management what the cost of each measure is. Um, I'm on that committee of legislative management. The number that, that management came up with was 3.4 billion every two years. Um, I know some have cr criticized that number um, and saying it should be 2.6 or 2.7. I think I've had that conversation with the main proponent, Rick Becker. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm asking him, well, what's the difference? And, and he would tell you that you have to take away some of the you know, bond, bond projects and things to get to the right number. Well, I asked those tough questions of the tax department and, and legislative council. They seem to think the number is still pretty close to that 3.4 billion, but let's just say it's 3 billion. Let's meet in the middle. Yep. If you look at any of the data I'm seeing going out on Facebook and other places, it's saying that the measure is um, um, basically two billion. It's saying a billion a year. And it's saying we can pay for that with 600 million that we currently have in, in excess. Um, that, and then that we can reduce or use a legacy fund earnings of 200 million, which I think is kind of what we have available. And then the other 200 million would be a reduction in, in you know, I don't know, some sort of um, corporate welfare or, or some other government spending program. Okay, well, that adds up to a billion. Now, keep in mind, that's not half of one of even 3 billion if we meet in the middle, it's not even half of 2.6. So I don't know where this billion number comes from. Well, then you go to repeat it the second year. 
Well, the second year, we don't have 600 million surplus because that was our, that's our um, biennium surplus. So okay. we can't spend that twice. So right. now we have a $600 million, million dollar hole there. Um, um, the legacy fund earnings, that's a biennial number, um, at least of what was available. We could probably free up another 200 million if we ended some stuff, but, but uh, even if we could do that, we'll say we could do that. And then we have the 200 million for that year of reducing programs, we can do that. So on that math, we're 600 million short to get to 2 billion, but the number's really at least 2.6, most likely three to 3.4. The numbers don't add up. And right. so what I'm concerned about for the voters is if you're gonna make a constructive comparison, you've gotta make sure that the numbers add up. And so, and, I, and I've been telling many of my friends who are proponents for Measure 4, I'm like, get numbers that make sense. Let's not pretend like we're operating on two sets of books here. Let's, let's figure out what it looks like. I mean, on, on the proposal I'm making, that's 500 million. Um, that's, operating on the only, that's operating on today's dollars. The same set of books that say 3.4 is my 500 million. Obviously it's a lot easier to come up with 500 million and it is 3.4. So right. we, we've got to do that. Um, I, okay, so, so the positives is everybody benefits now. Um, and uh, and then the, and the, the legislature has to spend a lot less on many programs in order to make the numbers work. Um, the cons of it to many people is that have legislature has to spend a lot, a lot less, which I don't necessarily see as a con, but I do see the structural problems. I don't see a limit on local spending, like a right. cap. And the proponents would say, well, well, the legislature should pass that and add it on. Okay, we can do that. Another flaw is saying, well, it re rewards all the reckless spending political subdivisions, the cities that max out taxation, they get locked in at their 24 rates forever. And the conservative cities that hardly spent as much, they get locked in at their 24 rates. How is that fair? I right. haven't seen really an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. the, the third critique is why are we giving all this money away to out-of-state um, landowners? Um, and of course, the, you always have the, the Bill Gates farmland example, which is what everybody loves to use. And, uh, and I don't think Bill Gates needs the money probably, but, but I, my, my, my um, honest concern about that is not just that they get a break. But I think if we did not tax property at all for out-of-state people, the cost of buying property is going to go up for our in-state residents. Uh, much the same as you'll see in some places where like BlackRock has started buying houses up in, uh, in metropolitan areas and making it almost impossible for first-time homebuyers to find something because BlackRock is buying and holding for 30 years. So you become a renter class. Well, in the same way, what happens if out-of-state people come in and start buying all the, what if California people come and start buying up the farmland, buying up the rental houses and, and so on? I think, I think it could cause problems. So we probably need a lot to protect against that if it passes. So again, it's, I'm prepared if it passes to absolutely implement it. Um, my my uh, pledge is that I won't vote for any tax increases to fund it, but mm -hmm. there are people that want to raise taxes to at least partially fund that $3.4 and uh, we're going to have to have some iron will to fight against that. And so it, it's my understanding even, and I could be misunderstanding this, but it's my understanding that cities and stuff like that could go and implement taxes on a different basis. And so they would actually make out well from this, even though right now it seems like a lot of cities, at least I've heard, are against it because they'll lose lo local control, but they could actually increase their budgets dramatically, potentially, if they got people to buy into it correct well it, oh that's correct and and to be honest with you the re reluctance of some of the people that don't want measure four i think to just jump on and back my proposal is yeah. because i think my proposal still gets rid of valuation right and valuation is their best smoke screen to cover for local tax hike, tax hikes because you've got many people that claim to be republicans even though it's a nonpartisan race that and maybe that should change but it's a nonpartisan race for local office that right. say we're Republicans, we're your fellow people, and yet mm -hmm. the budgets and spending go out the roof. Well, right. how did that happen? Well, it's valuation. The state makes us do it. Well, we know that's not a true argument, but I okay. think if I remove, if I, if my system or Measure Four removes the smoke, they're probably against it because there's no screen anymore. But, but you're absolutely right. They can have lots of different methods of taxation, but they could do that today. Mm -hmm. So if they said, okay. Um, we understand property tax is out of control. So we're going to limit our, our spending through taxation to 3% a year, more than last year. They could do that on their own to themselves. And then, and then anything else they needed, they could just raise the water bill or do whatever. They could do that now, but they don't. 
Right. And so that's, that's why they're against it. I predict that in my own community of West Fargo, which is one of the largest users of special assessments to fund road maintenance, mm -hmm. I think our special assessments are going to get used a lot more. That's going right. to be our, our uh, uh, flavor of tax increases, um, but they could choose any number of things. So your tax plan, you mentioned, um, uh, did you mention the full tax plan? Basically, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything yeah. there. Well, let me just recap it if I can. Yeah. So, you know, essentially we get rid of valuation. Right. And and we go to a square footage model for your property. And this would affect commercial and residential properties. Agriculture would be laid, left on the same system as it is today. Um, once that's established, we would, uh, you know, cities would set a cost per square foot. And then when that tax bill comes due, the legislature would give people approximately a 75% reduction on what they have to pay. So if your taxes were $8,000, you're gonna spend $2,000 in that new model. Um, and uh, then in addition to that, in addition to that, pardon me, I had somebody coming off. So, um, in addition to that, then we would go in and we would probably pass a property tax cap on budgets, or I should say, let me rephrase that, a local budget cap which might say that locals could only go up 3% over last year unless they get a vote of the people. I'd like to see that cap have a provision in there so that it was kind of a rolling average um, mm -hmm. over a number of years. So cities don't just rush to the maximum 3% every year, um, which is a risk we run um, under a straight cap. But I think we'll have some sort of a cap. I would also like to see us have a provision where uh, the, the cities and counties could no longer seize your primary residence for lack of paying your taxes. I think the, the idea that you never own your domicile, your house, because it can always get taken away, to me, that's an important um, up, um, thing that we need to look at. It rarely happens, but for the times that it does, I think it's very sad. So in a nutshell, they can't take your house, you get a 75% tax reduction, and we get rid of the smoke screen that cities use through valuation. Right, and it doesn't apply to businesses. It only applies to primary or your residences, um, correct? The, the the homestead tax credit is just like it sounds. It only provide yep. works for homesteads, but but uh, the, the the reform would apply toward businesses as well. Towards everything. All right. So then, do you feel confident? And I think this is probably the thing that grabs people the most. That this has been going on for a lot of time. There's been a lot of plans that have been brought to the legislature and no action has been taken. There has been, I shouldn't say no action has been taken. There has been some action taken and it's been backfilled uh, by local powers. But do you feel confident that there will be major reform in this legislative session if Measure 4 does not pass? Um, well, there's two factors to that. One is how well does Measure 4 do? Um, if Measure 4 fails at 18%, obviously nobody's going to care. I mean, I care, but most yep. people won't. If Measure 4 passes or fails with 45% of the vote, um, then it's believable that it'll come back in two years and, and pass the next time. And so at that point, legislators are, are motivated to do what they can to fix it in the meantime. Right. So if Measure 4 passes, people will get their relief. If it doesn't pass, I hope it has a good showing because that will enable people like me to push forward a plan that will provide the same type of relief at people's home that I think they're seeking when they support measure four. Very good. So, so that's crazy though, in my mind, because I get how measure four and how well it does would affect how the legislature would view how important the topic is or the issue is, but for that amount of people to sign on to it, period, that's a lot of people there's a lot of doors that were knocked. There was a lot of people that were, mm -hmm. it seems like that would catch the legislature's attention enough there. E either way, that it would actually get to an initiated measure. But you don't, obviously you have experience. You, you've been this, down this road before. You've seen these measures before. You don't feel like if it has a bad showing, you feel like if it has a bad showing in, in November, that it, will, uh, it won't be a priority in the next sessions. I don't think it'll be a priority to have the type of structural change we need yeah. legislatively to solve the, the problems that Measure 4 is trying to solve. Right. Um, I believe that they're going to tinker with property tax and try to okay. give people some sort of relief. I just think that, that it's going to be um, something easily backfilled again, um, or at the very least, it, it's, it might curb the growth 
But for people that are already in pain now, it's not going to relieve the pain enough. So, so yeah. I don't want to say like the legislature will do nothing, yeah. but I, I, it, it's going to feel like a mandate that, you know, if it does well, that the people probably liked measure four in concept, but maybe s- struggled with a few of the, the it, you know, part, components they didn't like. Um, right. And just enough people were like that, that it didn't pass. Um, yeah. Like I said, personally, I benefit more if it passes. So, I mean, right. nobody can confuse this for self-interest, yeah. but, um, but I'm elected to figure out um, legislative solutions. And I really leave the, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the democracy part of the voting that the voters get on initiated measures. I really don't want to try to twist their arm. I, I want them to do what they think is right. That's fair. All right. Well, we're, we're getting close to time, but I, I want your opinion on two more measures okay. while we have you. Measure two, this one affects how things can be presented to the ballots in the future. These initiated initiated measures, how they can come forth. It makes them a little more difficult to get on the ballot. Do you feel like this is a good thing for North Dakota or does this kind of take away the voice of the people a little bit? Well, and this is one of those areas where I, I, I will weigh in a little bit more because I had to vote on this in Bismarck to put it on right. the ballot. Right. And I believe I voted in favor of placing this on the ballot. My longstanding belief is that constitutions should be rarely amended. And when they're amended, they should be amended very um, directly, very specifically under a single issue and specifically in the sense that they shouldn't be voluminous. They should be um, setting up sort of a, a, a skeleton or a, or a template for what needs to happen and then let the statutes flesh that out. Um, many measures that have been passed in the past, um, and many influenced by billionaires that aren't from here, like yeah. Marcy's Law, like um, the ethics measure, like some of the other ones, um, they were voluminous and they were very easy to get on the ballot. And uh, many of them would not have, have succeeded with that, with a supermajority vote. Um, if for all those that don't think that having a supermajority or, or a higher bar to amend the Constitution is important, I would offer this. I'd say the Second Amendment would not be here if we could have had a 50% plus one um, remove and amend the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. Many of your freedoms that you have in the entire Bill of Rights would have been significantly modified in the last 200 plus years. But, but what it requires is two thirds of either Congress or the states to propose and three fourths to ratify. Well, if we said that it took two thirds of the of the uh, legislature to propose and three fourths of the population to ratify, we'd probably never change our state constitution. So I'm not asking for it to be that that strict. But 50 percent plus one is just not um, sort of a Republican way to look at it. And I say that small r meaning of a republic. I think uh, um, it shouldn't be a simple majority mob rule. It should be very, very specific and intentional to amend the Constitution. I wouldn't say that this measure was my favorite of all ideas um, to to raise the bar, um, but it is an option to rate, make it a little harder for us to, to amend that Constitution. And I think a higher bar is important. All right. And then lastly, one that is another initiated measure that I think has come with a lot of a uh, interest. I, I've mentioned it before on here, but I get to drive past a billboard in my town that says vote yes on measure five for economic growth. And that's all it says. A little bit misleading. Um, but measure five perhaps could lead to economic growth, but it definitely would lead to the uh, legalization of recreational marijuana in North Dakota. Obviously, you don't need to weigh in with the yes or no, but is it time? This has come up before. Is it, is it finally time? And is this measure worded in such a way that maybe it would be the best way forward if it was to become legal? Well, I get a kick out of all the ads. It's all yes, this or no, that. Nobody gives right. any reasoning. I mean, the other ad I saw was say nope to dope or something yeah. like that. I mean, I'm <laughs> like, you know, what does that tell us about the measure? I will right. say that the uh, that this measure, having reviewed it, um, it's, a, it's a statutory measure. It's not a constitutional measure, which means with two thirds vote in the legislature, we can override components of it and fix any problems that it has. But this, this measure, I think, is written about as well as a measure can be written. Um, I am not a proponent of it personally, nor am I a large opponent. I'm kind of neutral as an individual voter on this. But in the legislature, I've generally taken the, the point that I've, I've voted no on most legislative expansions of marijuana. 
but I've always mm-hmm. voted yes on the implementation of what the people supported, like uh, medical marijuana, for example. We had to do numerous bills to fix that and make it workable. Some would say it's not working as well as it should, and I'd probably agree with that, but you couldn't even possess the stuff after it passed the ballot without the legislature interceding. So it's important that this be statutory. Uh, I think we will tax it. I think we will probably have a net increase in revenues from it. Um, But we've got to be really careful that it does not change the way that society feels to us, because I think we live in North Dakota for a reason. And I don't think we want a single measure to um, greatly alter that. Do you think it opens the road to maybe more uh, uh, harder drugs such as Oregon saw and stuff like that. I think that's the horror story that people look to uh, where they're legalizing fentanyl and everything else. And I think they're now pulling those back. But do you think it opens a road to more stuff like that? Well, I think the road's always open on the, with the, when you have the initiative measure. Many states on the eastern side of the country don't have the initiative measure. So it's, okay. it has to come through legislation or some other way. So um, when you have the initiative measure, you always run the risk of that. But again, as long as it's statutory, you have representatives like myself that can overrule it. I don't really see it. um, You know, many say that marijuana is a gateway drug, and that may or may not be the case. But I don't think marijuana measures are the gateway to harder drug measures. I think that that it's it's very different than cocaine or something like that. Right. Very good. Well, I really appreciate you joining us for this time on the conversation and chatting about many things. But it was all good conversation. Well, thank you for having me, and I'd be happy to come back anytime. Absolutely. Thank you for watching this episode of The Conversation here at The Decoding. Be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Become part of The Decoding community. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.